Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. And our guest for this week's show is commercial real estate investment expert, Glenn Gonzalez. Now, Glenn is CEO and co founder of Obsidian Capital, a multifamily investment group based in Austin, Texas. Now, Glenn is an entrepreneurial individual with over 30 years of real estate experience. And since 1994, Glenn has been an instructor for multiple apartment associations, including Utah, Washington, and San Antonio. He is as humble as they come. And, you know, guys, you got to start at the bottom working as a maintenance man in an apartment complex. We're going to be talking about that today. And since that time, he's amassed more than 7,000 multifamily units with a portfolio value in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And so, um, guys, I'm excited to honor a good friend of mine and an incredibly successful real estate entrepreneur, Glenn Gonzalez, to the show. Glenn, how are you doing today? Doing great, Kevin, and I'm so excited to be here. I've been trying to get on your show with you for months, so you know you've got lots of cool uh, speakers that are here in front of me. But uh, thanks for making time, and I'm really excited to be on your show. No, I'm excited to have you here, buddy. It's always always good catching up at the different conferences and, and the boot camps and masterminds that, that we attend. And so we, I know we've joked about it, not joked about, it, we've talked about doing the show together for a while. And, and so now we're here. That's all that matters. And, um, yeah. you know, I forgot to actually mention, you know, before I actually really got to know you, uh, you, you had written a book and I don't know what, you know, how many years ago you had written that book. And uh, I remember our good friend, Rod Cleef, um, he, had, he had mentioned you many different times and spoke really highly of you. And I grabbed a copy of your book, Maintenance Man to Millionaire, and uh, just was a, it was a wonderful read and phenomenal book. And I forgot to mention that in your bio, but we'll make sure that we hit on that as well. Make sure folks know how to get a copy of that. But yeah. no, man, just excited to have you here. You, you've got an incredible story. And so why don't we start there? Because I you know, I, um, I gave you a very brief introduction, but I definitely skipped over some, some, you know, some of the many yeah. highlights of, of your life and, and kind of your upbringing and you getting into real estate and building into what it is today. And so maybe take a few moments, Glenn, if you would, I'll pass it back to you and tell some more about yourself and fill in the blanks, please. Sure. Well, you know what? It's, it's kind of interesting because I never, ever planned on writing a book, right? It's like, people would hear my story about, they're like, you started off as a maintenance man? I'm like, yeah, I used to paint apartments and fix toilets and pick up trash and dog poop. And and they're like, wow. And and now you own 7,000 units? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, how does that even happen? You know, and, and, and I kind of sit back. I'm like, yeah, how does that happen? You know, and so I really kind of like to tell my story about how you got from point A to point B, but it, it, it's probably longer than this show has uh, today, but I will tell you that when I, in a, in a brief uh, paragraph here in a nutshell, I was out there working and it was started off in Utah on a 400 unit apartment complex as a maintenance guy while I was going to school up at the University of Utah. And they asked if, you know, I wanted to help on work orders. And I said, yes, but really I got kind of jaded because, you know, the leasing agents are sitting there in the office talking on the phone. I'm outside shoveling walks. I mean, it was horrible, you know, shoveling snow off the walks. And I'm like, I wish I could have their job. And I remember the regional manager came to visit the property and I'm like, hey, do you think I can ever have a shot of being a, a leasing agent or a manager? And they're like, aren't you the maintenance guy? And I'm always <laughs> even the maintenance supervisor. I was like a maintenance tech. And I'm like, yeah, I am. And they're like, mm, I'll get back with you on that. <laughs> kind of deflated me to some degree, Kevin. And, uh, not too long ago, I kind of put a bug in, in the regionals here again. And then all of a sudden, they had a little 60-unit apartment community come up available. Well, they couldn't really afford a property manager or a maintenance guy full-time, but they thought of me. They're like, hey, you wanted to be a manager, but you're also you want to do both. You be a part-time manager, part-time maintenance guy. I'm like, mm -hmm. sure. And there's some pretty funny stories in the book about how I really was good at leasing up apartments, but not so good at the make ready, right? Because they'd come in with this like, hey my stove doesn't work and who in the world would move somebody in and the burners don't work. And I'm like, I'll send somebody over. And I didn't really tell them that was me, but you know, I was hoping they were gone to work or something. Knock on the door, maintenance, you know, come in like, Oh, you're here. I thought you were the manager. <laughs> yeah. And then they realized, Oh, you're a crappy maintenance guy. And I realized it too. And I'm like, we got a big kick out. I'm like, I could fix your burner. I'm sorry. But anyway, it made me kind of appreciate good, hardworking maintenance guys. Well, fast forward, I kind of, management, regional manager, worked for equity residential, worked for um, a guy named uh, Marcus, George Marcus, the guy that owns Marcus Milchap. You know, he had a 
privately owned value add company uh, that kind of competed with his excess man. It was it uh, Essex Property Trust. He had a REIT. But anyway, I worked for the private side and and got to know the ownership side. And that whole time, Kevin, in my career, it was always like, man, I wish I was the regional manager. They more money until I was managing, right? And they're like, oh, I wish I was the president of the management company that I owned my own management company. But then it was like, gosh, I'm tired of managing these guys' properties. You know who you know who makes the big bucks is the owner, the guy that owns them. So it was always like, I want to be the next guy. I want to be that guy because they inspired me. Uh, but you know, how do you buy apartments when you really are living on a W-2 and you don't have two nickels to mm-hmm. rub together and, uh, you know, you live paycheck to paycheck? That was a almost deflating once again. So, so you know, that, that's great. And I appreciate that, that, that background there. You know, I guess would love to hear a little bit more about the, the evolution of, you know, obviously, you always wanted to kind of move up the ranks uh, as a W-2 employee into the higher paid roles. You know, at some point you made your your way up to as high as you could maybe potentially go um, on the property management side and, and you know, realize that maybe the bigger picture was on the ownership side of it. And so, you know, give give us an idea of, of when that that pivotal moment occurred, but then really what were the action steps that you took to go from, again, just being a W-2 employee that was just living paycheck to paycheck to actually buying your first apartment building? What did that look like? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you on the chapter one of my book actually talks about the value of you, right? Because we all realize that, you know, maybe I don't really have the strength to do this, or I don't really know how to do this, but really you're a lot smarter than you think you are. Uh, Everybody is in their individual trades. And you probably have listeners that are all over entrepreneurs, right? They could be, you know, asphalt guys or painters or tree trimmers or whatever, construction guys or doctors or lawyers or whatever. They're making money. Um, They're really good at what they do. And I wanted to perfect my craft in apartments and property management. So, um, but I remember I was a regional manager. I was in Washington and I went to a mentor. And by the way, everybody should have mentors just to kind of walk you through things. I went to a mentor. His name is John Gibson. I'm like, Hey, John, I got this deal that I'm looking at. It's 60 units in Tacoma, Washington. And will you take a look at it and give me your thoughts? I think I want to try and buy it. I was a regional manager for a big REIT, but I was on the operational side. So I wanted to dip my toe in it. And, and, and John came to me and said, hey, Glenn, I got a better deal for you. I've got a 40-unit deal that you might be interested in. And I think it was 42 units or 44 units, small deal. He's like, I'll sell it to you on contract, but you got to come up with a $150,000 down payment. Right. In today's day and age, it's like 150. That's not a lot of money. But when you're a when you're working, living paycheck to paycheck, I didn't have 150000 I got, heck, I got five kids I got to feed. So... I went to my boss and another vendor and I said, I found a deal and we need $150,000. So you put down 75 and you put down 75 and we can all be equal partners. And like, well, how much are you putting in? I'm like, zero. They're like, well, how does that work? We're putting up all the money. I'm like, look, we're going to make a lot of money on this deal. And you get your money back before I get my, my money back. And very unsophisticated, Kevin, very, very unsophisticated, equal partners. Well, we bought that deal. And the 150000 was actually not a down payment. The owner, John, says, okay, the 150000 I'm going to require you to put in the deal and fix it up. I'm going to carry a note back for 100%. Like, why would you do that? He's like, trust me, you're going to be successful, but you need some working capital. And most people don't come up with working capital. So we came with the working capital. Honest to goodness, we fixed all the problems that John said they were there. And we operated this little property in Puyallup, Washington. Some of your own, some of your listeners may know where Puyallup is because there's a big fair in Washington there. And uh, operated this little deal for a year, year and a half, and sold it, Kevin, for a million and a half more than we paid for it. Now I was a regional manager. I was living paycheck to paycheck. I had to come up with 150 grand and do the math. Right, we got uh, some money back, and I gave back the two investors, my equal partners, their seventy-five thousand dollars. But then they got big checks back after that. Mm-hmm. I did make a mistake, though. The guy we sold it to, we carried a note back for about a half a million dollars. And he defaulted on that. So even though we made a million and a half, uh, we lost a half in carrying a note to a bad borrower on the sell side. That's a whole nother story that could be on your show. <laughs> but we made some money. And I remember looking at that check that I got as an owner of a 44. And it was the biggest check I'd ever seen in my life. And I'm like, I can get on board with this. 
but I wasn't prepared to quit my W-2. And I realized you kind of have to be in the industry to make money. You kind of need to know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so it, it was my boss who was my boss it trusted me. The vendor trusted me. They were both in the industry. They both knew the opportunity because they were in the business. And so what, what year was this? Just for some context. Uh, uh, I, that's a great question. 2004. Okay. Three. Long time ago, right? 20 years yeah. ago. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And, and a lot has changed. There obviously was uh, the Great Recession in, 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 in 08, which was some turbulent times. We find ourselves in another pivotal moment, um, you know, uh, from an economic sense and I guess many other senses as well. But you know, so would love to, you know, just again, uh, kind of continue in the evolution because I, I think we've set the basis here as to kind of yeah. how you got your start, the first deal. Yeah. Um you Let know, me go into my first syndicated yeah. deal. Maybe that will help. Yeah, know, like absolutely. Real deal, absolutely. right? Absolutely. So I've been in property management at this time in my year for, for years in my career. And I owned my own property management company, a third party fee management company. I was pretty good at it. Uh, a bank called and said, hey, do you want to, uh, uh, they had talked to uh, you know, a friend, owner, partner of mine, do you want to buy this? And he's like, no way, we don't want to buy this. So they called me, the bank says, can you give us a pro forma on what it will take to turn this property around? We're getting ready to foreclose. And I said, huh, yeah, I'll look at it. So from a strictly a property management standpoint, I said to the bank, you need to come up with a million dollars cash. You need to fix these down units. We need to, through the foreclosure, you can remove some of the restrictions uh, on, the, um, uh, on the affordable side. Uh, it wasn't like a tax credit, but it had some other affordable components uh, through a nonprofit. All that gets wiped out through foreclosure. So they said, great idea. We're going to foreclose. And I said, what are you going to do after that? They said, we're going to fire sell it. I said, for how much? They're like, well, we want to just cover our note. I said, carry a note back for me. I will come up with a million bucks. And it was a 200 unit deal in San Antonio. And I said, it's fixable. And they said, you really believe in that? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, we'll carry a note back. Do you have a million bucks you could put in the deal? I'm like, no, I don't have a million bucks. I might as well have 5 million bucks. You know, they're like, I said, but I can get it. And, uh, and I'll tell you, Kevin, that was the hardest deal that I'd ever done raising capital. I'd raise $1 million to buy a 200 unit apartment complex in San Antonio. Seems pretty easy unless all the investors are like, have you ever done this before? And it's like, no, this is my first one. It's like call me when you've done it before. Sounds great, but we're a pass. So when nine people out of 10 tell you no, what do you do? You know, you call and you say, well, do you know somebody who might? And that person says, yeah, I might know somebody. So I was cold calling people that I didn't even know, Kevin, that were complete strangers that could believe in the deal. And it was a tough raise, but we raised the million and we owned it for 12 months and sold it. And all the investors that did go in on that million bucks got a 47% return on their money. Nice. Now they were bragging to their friends and they have said, hey, do you got any more deals we could do, right? And then it just, it seemed like the floodgates were opened after that. Um, people that I'd been in business with for years were selling me deals off market. I then got a, a, a friend of mine that was named Ed. He was 80 years old. And I remember telling him, well, when he was 70, I said, hey, if you ever want to retire, call me. I'll buy your, your company from you. He called me a decade later and says, you want to still want to buy my company? I said, what do you got? He's like, I got eight deals up in DFW. I said, I'll buy all eight of them. And it was an off-market deal. Went from a handshake to a purchase sale agreement. And we had to raise, you know, 25, 30 million in equity back in the day and bought close to 1,500 units from a guy named Ed. And we staggered them over six months so we can close them on time. We went to family offices. We went to individuals. We went to uh, private equity. We did three of them were crowdfunded deals through crowdfunding. And we raised the money to close all those deals. And those averaged a 35 IRR on those deals. Wow. So those investors were happy and wanted to do more deals. So then it just started evolving, right? Mm -hmm. So is this post 2008? Uh, when, uh, let me think, when did we close those Two, 2013? Yes. Just, just what, wondering what, um, you know, wondering just, you know, given the, the, you know, the, the sense of time that we're in today and, um, just, it hasn't been necessarily a repricing, um, yeah. um, outside, outside of the office market. Right. But um, yeah. yeah, that's its own, that's its own unique anomaly. Um, 
you know, but we really haven't seen any any other assets really get, re- especially multifamily. So let's speak to multifamily because that's the asset class yeah. of, of of choice in this conversation. Um, would love to learn what your business looked like in 08 and, and ultimately any any challenges that you faced. And then, you know, kind of parlaying that into any pivotal changes that you guys are making today uh, in your business uh, in preparation for um, some, you know, worsening economic times that we might be seeing yeah. here in the coming 12 to 24 months. For, for sure. You know, right now it's interesting. I, uh, Mike and I found a deal um, not too far from Austin where we sit up in a little town called Taylor. It's on a corridor right south of Waco, but north of Austin, Texas. And we came across a 232 unit deal uh, where we could assume a Fannie Mae loan that had 2.75% interest for the next nine and a half years fixed, right? So uh, we're like, this is fantastic. So we'll buy that. And we, so there was a kind of a dispute between the LP and the GPs. They were kind of forced to sell. So we were there, we made our offer and said, we'll close it in 45, 60 days. Um, and we did. But, you know, it's interesting because people are now so afraid of the interest rates being so high and variable that when it comes time to get new financing on stuff, people are nervous. Um, investors can now put some money in the bank or in a money market account or buy bonds and probably do better than uh, some deals that have some bridge loans on them, right? Because the bridge loans were pretty good when it was 5%, 4%. Now they're up to 7%, 7 and a quarter, 8 And now that those bridge loans are gobbling up all the cash flow out of deals. So having a deal that's fixed interest for still another 9, 10 years left, uh, that's that was a good deal for us. And we had to raise about 10 million bucks, 10.2, I think. And we closed that deal about three weeks ago. Um, what, what did the, the pricing look like? I guess you, the pricing that you paid versus what was paid X number of years ago. When, when was that uh, individuals you bought from? When did they acquire? Was it in the last two They had owned years? it about, yeah, they owned it about three years. Okay. And, and I can understand why the LPs were a little frustrated. Um, I can't go into too much detail sure. uh, on this call, but I will tell you some of the basic property management 101 wasn't being followed. Um, distributions didn't always go to the investors. They went to maybe the GP and some of his friends or something. So it was, I don't know, it was just tough, right? So, um, but to answer your question on the pricing, Kevin, you know, you know, we paid uh, 22 million for that deal on 232 units in Temple. So, you know, do some hundred and something door. I don't know, I should probably do some calculations before. I yeah, just that's, that's close. I mean, that's close. I mean, roughly a hundred hundred thousand yeah. dollars a door. Is that is that is that is that below market or is that at market? That, that's about average right now for okay. that vintage. Yeah, uh, kind of mid eighties product, hundred grand a door. Um, mm-hmm. but it needed some work, so I think we're all in at like one hundred and five. Versus right now, stuff in Austin is trading for new construction in the two hundred and twenty thousand a door. Mm-hmm. Right, so you can kind of see the discrepancy there between buying some older product uh, versus newer product. And really, you're still getting good rents. I will tell you that we we dabble in both, you know, workforce housing, B product. And we also dabble in the brand new ground up stuff. So we've built, you know, some stuff. Mike and I have just finished a new construction deal. Um, and to put it in perspective on the new stuff, that we're building for 200 a door, 200,000 a unit, we're getting 1,600, 1,700 in rent versus the stuff that we bought up there in Temple, we're getting you know 1,200 to 1,300 in rent. Mm. But really they're $100,000 difference in pricing, yeah. right? So you can still make good money with the right demo, with the right financing in terms, uh, not to mention on the older product, we could put some cost segregation in there and get some tax benefits to the investors where they've got negative K-1s uh, in year one due to cost segregation and other CapEx numbers, but yet they're getting a good cash on cash return on their money. So is it, you know, do you think the opportunity at the present time is maybe, you know, trying to find a, some of those, maybe it's not a distressed asset per se, but maybe a distressed partnership to where there's some, you know, attractive underlying debt that was put in place two or three years ago that's assumable. Is that, 
is that the play? And you know, are there you know potential other opportunities coming out of the pike, or do you think this one was kind of an anomaly? Or just curious to hear your thoughts there. And then, yeah, um, outside of that, um, you know, when do you foresee a, a, if a time would come to be bullish? You know, like, yeah, that's a great question. Somewhat loaded, Kevin, and I'm going to take my best. It is loaded. Yes, go for it. Have that <laughs> you know, we have offered on several deals recently that have been brokered. And we have not won those opportunities. The reason we haven't won is because to some degree, some of those things are still selling on five caps, but the interest rate is 7% on some of this new financing uh, or 6%, right? So you're going to be on a distribution basis upside down. I think we're competing against some big, really deep pockets that are gobbling up real estate where they're not really that worried about the cash on cash or the IRR, they want to own the real estate. Um, but to me, a lot of those don't make sense to my investors and therefore I'm not buying those deals. But on the other hand, that one did make sense because they were selling at a five and a half, six cap going in, but yet we had some 2.75% interest rate. Mm -hmm. We still had room to give a preferred return to the investors. So where are we in this market cycle? There's still a little disconnect between sellers wanting to accept, you know, a higher cap rate on their sales price. They still want the lower cap rate. So sellers are now sitting on this dream that we could still get more money. But I also feel like at the same time, there's going to be some sellers that can't get a refinance done on their bridge loan. And that loan is going to come due and no one's going to pay for a very low cap rate. So they're going to be forced to do something, either put more money in, recapitalize it, ask money from investors, or they're going to have to sell it at a realistic sales price, which is where the opportunity is coming. And you'll be seeing that, Kevin, in the next six months to a year. When a lot of these terms are resetting, is that where you're getting at? A lot of the terms are going to come due, right? People that got a three-year bridge or a three-and-a-half-year bridge loan, they are going to be due soon. And they are, and those sellers are going to be forced, like I said, mentioned a moment ago with those two options, sell it at a decent sales price where people will actually buy it, or you got to come with more equity to the table to refinance. They had an 85% or an 80% loan to value, but now Fannie is only lending 65% loan to cost, right? So they're conservative in their underwriting for the higher interest rate. So there's a delta. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm just I'm wondering if, you know, given that there's still a lot of liquidity out there in space and as you as you just mentioned, you know, there there there's still a fairly significant disconnect of of, you know, sellers pricing expectations to maybe what the market should be, but there's still buyers out there paying, you know, those those compressed uh, you know, to you and I aggressive cap rates. And so I'm wondering and there's not there's not a oversaturation of a product on the market. And so I'm wondering when those term defaults come to play if if there still won't be very competitive buyers looking to pay premiums um you know even given the you know the again the the, the debt markets yeah. and and where they're at and and you're just still finding that that lack of of yield in, in deals but they're willing to take you know negative negative leverage to to get the deal done and just yeah. add to their portfolio so is that is that a concern and again just we're not we're not nowhere in the very few parts of this country um have met the housing supply and especially yeah. when we're talking about like your market, right? Like in yeah, San Antonio Texas. and Austin and, and Dallas, right? I mean, the major shortage, just like here yeah. in Florida. And so, um, yeah, that's the variable, Kevin, that is very hard for even us to pinpoint. And that is we have so many people moving to Texas right now from all over the country that are in migration. There's not enough housing to house them. Right. So, but the wages aren't keeping up. So a lot of the people can't afford the rent we were able to charge but some are. And so like in the Austin area, for example, Kevin, we got 16,000 new units coming online for new construction. And right now they're all being absorbed. And uh, I was talking to some people that work for CoStar, some of the analysts there, and they said that we'll see a little bit of decrease in the absorption on the new product coming online because of the timing. So many of them are coming online at the same time. That in the Austin area, which is all the way, all the way north of Austin. I mean, it's all of Austin and the surrounding areas, uh, but they'll still be absorbed. Hmm. 
and and there's people still moving here. So you've got this shortage of housing. You've got rents that were going up in this area here, 10, 12 percent. That's that's tapered off, by the way. You know, now we're into yeah, what are you seeing? Uh, single five, six percent okay. on rent growth here. OK, because, which is which is legitimate equilibrium. Right. I mean, like that's yes. that's, that's more realistic. It is realistic and sustainable. But, you know, for a while here, it was 10, 12 percent. People were like, wow, that's crazy. And they were buying and people were paying three caps and four caps. And it just got really crazy. And now they're building all kinds of units. Not me too. I'm building two. I can build it cheaper and I can go buy one for, you know, I buy the dirt and get it constructed at at or below what they're reselling 90 stuff for or 20 stuff for. To that point, is there not just an opportunity, given that you've got uh, some development experience, and again, you've got a few uh, a few deals that you built from the ground up, just to to, you know, to put yeah, your focus so and emphasis on that space? Or I have a I have a unique advantage, and that is being in the local market here. We bought all of our dirt off market, just principal mm -hmm. to principal. Um, we went through the zoning change, so our basis in the in the ground is probably much lower than most because yeah. if you want to buy some stuff here, you're going to probably buy it um, at a brokered price. And some developers have taken all the way to entitlement and then they'll just sell you an entitled piece. Mm -hmm. But still, I mean, if you can construct and you're in the construction world, you can construct it cheaper yourself. So yeah, um, it's, so it's really interesting time right now, right? All those variables are just, you, you take your interest rate that's high, you take your demand on real estate, and the availability of stuff. There's a lot of stuff on the market for selling and they're still getting lower cap rates, Yeah, yeah. which doesn't make sense to me, but they are, you know? <laughs> so, so I, I'd love to switch gears if we could, Glenn. And, uh, you know, we always, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've had many, many more deals that have either met or exceeded expectations, but you know, there's, there's always those couple of deals that have given us extra gray hairs, kept us up late at night and just added, undue amounts of stress to our life and and you know from the front you know from the front end looking in in the beginning you know we did our best to underwrite we understood the markets uh, understood the deal but complexities and skeletons exist in every deal and some more That's than right. others right yep and so any you know when I, when I speak speak to that topic is there is there a particular deal that comes in mind that again added you know, just additional amounts of stress to your life that didn't go as planned that just you couldn't wait to exit out of it. If so, you know, would love to hear the particulars, maybe share details of, um, you know, what the challenges were, how you overcame them, if you did, and then maybe some lessons mm -hmm. that you learned from it. Yeah. Let me share with you three or four of my failures. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, uh, you got to hear the, you know, the, yeah. the bad with the good, right? This is yeah. what a lot of people just never talk about. And it's, it's really, yeah. it's part so of we had a deal down here in Austin and, and we underwrote it and we felt like it was going to be a solid, you know, 18 IRR. We got into it and we were renovating units and we were just plagued with homelessness. People next to us were homeless and they would come in and jump in our swimming pool and bathe in our swimming pool. And we tried to get security there uh, to kind of prevent that from happening. But other people were dumping their trash out on the street. And the city's like, that's not our street. It's your street. And like it's dedicated. So the city wouldn't come, you know, and just plagued with all kinds of just challenges. So we decided we'll finish our renovation. Oh, by the way, we were renovating units. Sometimes people would break in at night and steal our appliances that we just bought brand new. Mm. Right? And so those kind of challenges hurt, hurt, hurt. We decided let's fix it up and sell it. And we did. And somebody backed out of buying it from us because the interest rates had gone up, you know, so much from the time they put it under contract. This was like a year ago, right? And so the first round of interest rates had gone up and the feds were talking about raising them again. So this buyer backed out. I'm like, dang it, you know? So we talked to the local broker that we'd hired and, and he was great. Um, Kent did a fantastic job for us. He's like, why don't we just reprice it? Let's set realistic expectations. Um, and we ended up selling it. We still gave the investors, um, I think the deal earned about a 10 or a 12% IRR. <laughs> But what we did is we took our um, disposition fee and actually shared it with the investors just to juice their returns a little bit. So mm -hmm. I forewent my disposition fee so that we can get them in the teens. But that was a painful, painful deal. So um, and then anyway, you know, again, just, you know, just thinking through of like what 
what could have been done differently? Is that, you know, what, how does that next person that comes in, what do you, is, do they have the silver bullet? Is that fixable? Or is that just one of those problems that God, that, that thing's going to be plagued with issues until I always um, say like you can, you you can fix a property, but you can't fix the neighborhood per se. Right. That's so, right. That's right. We could not fix the neighborhood. So battle. we managed it. We had the right financing. Um, we, we did all the things that we felt like we could do and the deal just didn't perform as well because of outside influences. Yeah. Let me shift gears on a little bit. We also had a deal down um, south of here, down by the Bay. Uh, and we had 400 units down there and it was right through COVID. So the manufacturer down there in the chemical plant laid off, gosh, 2000 employees during COVID. Uh, some of them were staying at my properties and they were not paying their rent. So it was a Fannie Mae loan, so I couldn't evict them. But Fannie did say, hey, look, you can you know, have some forbearance on your debt, which I think we got three to five months or something like that in forbearance. But COVID lasted so much longer than that. I still couldn't evict them. They still weren't paying. I didn't get any more relief on my debt. I fed it another $1.5 million. Our equity partner fed it $2 million, and we just couldn't keep it afloat. Mm. couldn't keep it afloat and it didn't end well. So, you know, that was painful. Let's, let's talk about that. I mean, so what, 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 what percentage of your, of your tenant base um, worked at that plant that shut down? I mean, was it the majority? So it was not. So there were several things that happened there. Uh, probably 20% of our tenant base worked at that plant. Um, but we also had that whole town, um, had construction workers and other blue collar workers. Well, this was all, there was a hurricane or something that happened not too far away off the Texas coast. So a lot of the contractors that were working there locally pulled out of town and went over to Houston or Galveston or, you know, where they were to, to kind of fix some of the mm -hmm. damage done. So then that group of workers were also standing up right. They left town. It was just a series of all kinds of terrible things. Um, that happened that was outside of our control, COVID and, uh, you know, uh, uh, hurricane, um, those types of things we can't control. And I couldn't evict them and, you know, yeah. just all kinds of terrible things. Is there, is there, a, you know, just trying to dissect this one a little bit in COVID again, just uh, very much an anomaly, obviously weather events do occur. Um, you can't predict them, but they, they do occur. But um, the COVID thing just threw everyone for, you know, for a loop. Um, but just, I guess, speaking to the, the chemical plant and, you know, obviously it, it wasn't a, wasn't a one horse town or one factory town, but obviously there, there was a, at least a reasonable amount of folks that, that, you know, once they were laid off, um, you know, that financially impacted the property there. Is that, is that kind of, is that a, a criteria that you look a little harder at now when you look at maybe a, a property that's in the secondary or tertiary yes. market? Um, if it's got a X percentage of, of, of residents that work at XYZ plan or factory, you know, is that yeah. reason for concern yeah. now when it might not have been back then? Yeah, that very much so. I will tell you, I had a very similar uh, um, variable with the, with the data points, but the outcome was very different. We bought three deals up in, in Colleen, Texas, mm -hmm. and they have a big army base there, Fort Hood my third largest um, military in the United States. Um, and we factored in our underwriting deployments because we knew that when the soldiers would get deployed, we would immediately see a decrease in occupancy. Um, but we also factored in it only lasting 60 days. Why? Because soldiers come home, right? So if you can know what the variables are and underwrite to them and just be very honest with yourself and your underwriting, you'll do okay. So whether Same thing with student housing, right? Sometimes some student housing, they rent rooms during the terms, but then it goes down in the summertime, right? So some of your listeners may have underwritten to, you know, a vacancy in the summertime on student housing, or they may have switched to year-long leases and just took less rent. So, but to answer your question, you do look at those demographics. You look at the variables on whether there's one particular employer that houses, you know, um, 30 percent of your residents or more, <laughs> you, you've yeah. you've got to stop and give pause to what are the risks there. I could not have predicted COVID. Who
who would have thought those factories would shut down? Uh, they shut right. down temporarily, but they went right back to full capacity a year and a half later. Mm -hmm. Darn it, you know, a lot, a lot of bad things can happen in six months or a year sure. <laughs> sure. when you don't have revenue. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. No, but very interesting. You know, and another another question, speaking to maybe value add, a lot, a lot of your business is based on value add, buying some older vintage properties that, you know, that that haven't been renovated or updated for, for a number of years. You know, we just we had a big run over the last decade of 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 you know value add investors coming into the multifamily space. Is there still a large percentage? And we can just speak to your markets, you know, Houston, yeah. um, Dallas, uh, Austin, San Antonio, those markets. Is there still are there a lot of vintage properties left that have not been touched? There are. Yes, there are. Okay. Uh I think here's one of the risks, right? Is because there's so much opportunity that your basis on the unrenovated is a little higher. So you are now able to buy that property and hopefully renovate it and make money. But I will tell you that I just toured a deal where 30% of the property is not renovated. So the broker's like, hey, you can, there's 30% left. After interviewing the manager, she's like, look, we're only getting a $50 spread between our renovated and our unrenovated. And if it's really costing you, you know, 15,000 or $16,000, to renovate that unit you're only getting 50 bucks that doesn't you know work. to me it doesn't it's not a very good return you know uh, low single digits where we're used to renovating and getting a 20 percent more uh you know on our mm -hmm. investment there and maybe getting a very large bump on the rents interesting um i will tell you that on that aspect we decided it really wasn't worth it now i have others where none of the units are touched whatsoever and the units are $300, $400 below market. And you can buy those and still make money, but they're so picked over, Kevin, they're hard to find. So if, I might, if you've got listeners are out there, it's like, I've got a fully 100% building that none of them have been renovated or touched. That could be a gold mine in this market because there's been such a push and such a run on buying 80s and 90s product and renovating them. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. interesting. Yeah. So let's talk about the book. Let's talk okay. about the book, but but yeah. more importantly, where where can we find it? What what are folks going to learn if they uh they give the time to read it? I think everyone should. Yeah, read the phenomenal it is. Book. It is. You got a you got an incredible story, Glenn, and you're such yeah. an incredible, humble person. And uh, um, anyway, I, I would suggest that everyone grab a copy. But where can they grab a copy? Uh, Amazon. Just go on Amazon. It's called the uh, Maintenance Man and Millionaire by Glenn Gonzalez. Right. You just type in Glenn exactly. Gonzalez or Maintenance Man. Uh, sorry, I don't have it on Audible. <laughs> I haven't recorded it, but it's an easy read. Um, I will share with you a story, Kevin, that happened at maybe one of the conferences you were in attendance on. We were introducing a bunch of each other or ourselves at a conference, and I was um, sitting across from this gentleman, and he's like, I don't really want to tell you my name. I want to introduce that guy over there. And he pointed at me, and I'm like, crap, what's he going to say? Who is I don't know him. I don't recognize him. I was trying to look at his name, but he told this story. He's like, I bought one of the deals that Glenn sold. And I'm like, oh no, where are we going with this? <laughs> you know, and he's like, and here's what happened. I bought the deal. I had non-refundable earnest money. I had my financing. And one week before closing, I found out that the boiler, the chiller for the whole property had broken and it was beyond repair. And so I went to my business partner and I said, we're buying this guy a new chiller. My old business partner at the time was like, there's no way we're buying, we're paying that much money for a chiller. And I said, dude, we're making a ton of money on the sale. We're going to buy the guy a chiller and we're going to put it in before it closes. He's like, you're not going to do it. And I'm like, we are doing it. So I actually had a business argument with my business partner about who's going to pay for this because in his mind, dude, they put up non-refundable earnest money. They have no yeah. choice. They're going to lose their earnest money or they're not going to quote whatever. Right. And I'm like, dude, you don't do that to people in this industry because it will come back and bite you. I said, think about it. What if the roles were reversed? What would you want to do? So um, I called the broker, Al Silva. He's with Marcus Milchap. And I said, Al, here's what we're going to do. Chiller's toast. I can't get one before closing, but I put 50% down. It's been ordered and I will give the other 50% of the cost when it's installed and I'll put it in the escrow account at the title company, total of hundred thousand, hundred and two hundred thousand dollars right? So we did the right thing, Kevin. That's awesome. I love it. We did the right thing. Now this guy, fast forward, it's five, six months later, 
he's now sitting across from me at a conference introducing and telling this story, <laughs> but it was from his perspective, right? He, I'm the guy that bought it from Glenn. And, um, and he was like, I would, I would do business with Glenn again, which in my mind is the best endorsement. Well, that story Absolutely. is now in the book and it is written by Al Silva from the broker's perspective, because, you know, deals fall apart for a lot less. And that whole story is in the afterword um, by Al Silva, the broker, and his afterword is titled, the value of reputation. So if we're going to be in this business for any length of time, and you don't want to be a one and done, to your listeners, to everybody, I would say, just do the right thing. Because what comes around goes around. I mean, that isn't that the definition of integrity, right? Doing the right thing, even when nobody's watching. I mean, that that's, that speaks to your character, my friend. That's um, that's huge. And uh, you're right. It, it, everyone thinks it's uh, you know, those that, that might not be in it, they're listening, they're, you know, they're, they're they're not necessarily in the trenches. They might think it's such a huge industry, but it's when you really break it down, it's not. I mean, it's um, it's smaller than what you think, and and you get to know the other players, and you might not ever know, you know, some of the larger reads and like the you know the executives in those groups. But ultimately, the guys like you and I, the guys that are you know, if they have hundred million or five hundred million dollar portfolios or even multi billion dollar portfolios, I mean, they're most of the time you'll find that they're guys just like you and I that are just yeah. entrepreneurial in nature. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, are self-made and uh, built their business from scratch and, and uh, you get to know each other pretty quickly. You go to these conferences. I mean, there might be only, uh, you know, I'm speaking to like an industry conference. There might only be a, a thousand or two people there. Right. And uh, that sounds like a lot, but it's really not in the grand scheme of things. So um, right. a bad reputation makes its way around very quickly. You don't want yeah. to be that guy. So, and I think that's what attracted me to you, Kevin, when we were at the conference and stuff, your personality, the way you do business, the way you hold yourself, the way you speak with other people at the conference, you know, you're not bragging about all your success. You're just a good guy. And that's what made Mike and I is like, man, we'd like to sure do some business with Kevin sometime. And that's why I'm honored to even be on your show. Right. And so. I feel Thank the you. same way, my friend. Now, uh, yeah. you know, sentiments back your way as well. And I appreciate you coming on here. I appreciate you sharing your story. It's, a, it's an incredible one. And, um, you know, for those that want to learn more about you, Glenn, and, and not just the book, but actually, you know, uh, any investment opportunities that you have, your business, and just uh, read more about Obsidian Capital, where's the best place to find you? So our website is obsidiancapitalco.com, or is it okay to put my phone number out here to your uh, listeners? If you'd like to, yeah. absolutely. Area code 512-937-5964. That's my cell number, right? So- for those that were listening and they're like at the stop sign right now, they You're are like, man, 512-937-5964. Thanks. <laughs> Guys, just don't, don't call him after hours. Don't call him on the weekends. You know, if you're going to give him a shout or shoot him a text, do it normal business hours. All right. So yeah, you're a brave awesome. man by giving that out there, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, Glenn, awesome. Always good catching up with you. I appreciate you coming to the show. We'll have to do a round two at some point in the future, but uh, wishing you all the best. I know you just got a deal you just took down. So Wishing you huge success with that, that most recent deal and all future deals. So um, we'll look forward to talking soon, my friend. Thank you, Kevin. All righty, guys, that's all we have for this week's show. So until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Bob, wishing you huge success. Take care now. Yeah.